Hello everyone, and welcome to my full breakdown of the Monster Hunter World Special Developer Update that Capcom released on December 10th, 2018. First of all, I wanted to mention that I think it was a really smart move for Capcom to release a timetable on new content. It helps your player base adjust their expectations so that they don't feel strung along waiting for the next update or expansion. I also think it helps to build hype and awareness for your product, so it's kind of like having a teaser trailer for your next movie. It's just all around a worthwhile investment to make that communication with your audience. Now, the developer update was divided into four parts one for each update. The first thing we'll be getting into is Arch-Tempered Cove Tiroth. A lot of people were speculating that this would happen after the winter seasonal event when Capcom claimed they were having technical difficulties with Cove Tiroth for the consoles, despite the fact that they would have normally made her available during a seasonal event. Plus, she was also available on the PC like you normally would expect. The first time someone ran this idea past me that they were having technical difficulties because they were actually updating her to Arch Tempered, I was like, no, right, like, no way. They wouldn't make Cove Taroth an Arch Tempered monster, we've already fought her too much. But deep down inside, I knew that it was a possibility, and it looks like it came true. So according to Rozo, the Cove Taroth fight will start out like it normally would, which is too bad because it's actually the beginning of the fight that I find the most tedious. But yeah, it starts out like normal, and then if you meet certain conditions, she'll enter a new furied state, and that's when we're going to see those arch-tempered changes. Personally, I would have preferred something like what they did with arch-tempered Zenijiva, where you actually skip the first part of the fight and jump right to the end. I think that's what they should have done with Kovtaroth, but I don't want to judge it too early. We haven't actually tried her, so let's reserve judgment until after she comes out. Rozo explicitly says that in her fury mode, Kovtaroth's going to have new attacks, so hopefully it's going to be done as well as Arch Tempers and Ajiva was. This is especially important because I'm already so tired of fighting Kovtaroth. I mean, my mind has gone pretty numb grinding her for the Rarity 8 relics, so the new Arch Tempered fight would have to be pretty different for me to not start out already feeling bored. I think the worst case scenario is that she has like, maybe two new moves that hardly change the fight, but now she also does have a much larger health pool, or half of her old moves now one-shot the player, and she just has a whole bunch of stingy rewards just like before. That's the worst case scenario. You'll notice, based on this screenshot, she's going to be giving out incandescent rewards. He called them like rainbow rewards, which I'm not sure what that means. Will it affect the way the weapon actually looks? We didn't get to see any of the new rewards. Uh, Ro Rozo mentioned that some of the rewards will be more powerful versions of the gold rewards, as well as entirely new appraisal weapons. So it already sounds pretty grindy, because you know you're going to want all of your old Kulftaroth weapons to be upgraded by, you know, like whatever it is, like 10 attack and they've mixed the new appraisal weapons in along with that. Unfortunately, I think Kof Taroth has been one of my biggest gripes about Monster Hunter World, and they've simply doubled down on this super grindfest RNG monster. The best case scenario for Arch-Tempered Kulturoth is that you can quickly push her into the Arch-Tempered mode, hopefully not by having to do enough damage within a certain period of time, though you just know that's going to be it because having a DPS check be the condition for accessing the Arch-Tempered fight is probably going to make her feel both extremely grindy and now also very try-hard. Uh, we don't know what the conditions will be though, and I'm just hoping it's something simple, right? Continuing on with this best case scenario, after you've triggered the condition in the least boring way possible, I hope that she has completely reworked moveset with some unique gameplay changing ideas. Something that gives you a new experience, which is what I think we got from Zenijiva's groundbreaking ring attack. And finally, with the incandescent rewards, hopefully the new appraisal rewards are just mind-blowingly cool, so that I feel like there's really a good reason to go in and fight Kov Taroth again. I personally feel like we've been needing new weapons from other monsters, and instead all we've gotten were the additional Rarity 8 weapons that they added to Cove's loot pool, and now we've got these incandescent rewards that are also being added to Cove's loot pool, which is going to make it so that you have to sink an unbelievable amount of time into hunting just one monster in Monster Hunter World, never mind like Gyrotodus or Barret or any of those other monsters. 
Now, at least we're getting a new Kovtaroth Gamma Armor Set, which I think has a lot of potential. They could possibly add a set bonus skill to the Gamma version, though we've never seen Capcom do that with the Gamma set before. On the other hand, we've seen them rework weapons and add a skill to them with the Lunastra weapon set, so I'd say anything is possible. Since the Gamma Armor sets have always included skills from the previous Alpha and Beta versions, it's highly likely that the Kulf Gamma set will give us new ways to build Agitator, Free Element, Handicraft, Power Prolonger, Peak Performance, Critical Boost, Stun Resistance, and Wide Range. One of the best things about the Kulf Terrath Armor is that it gives the player high defense against fire, and most of the dangerous monsters in the world are fire damage dealers. Alright, well personally, Arch-Tempered Kulturoth was kind of a big letdown for me. Don't get me wrong, I think if you haven't already grinded her a whole bunch, this event is going to be tons of fun for you. However, I'm personally regretting how much I've already fought her for weapons that are probably not going to be outdated, only because Capcom probably took them and most likely added a bit more damage to be incandescent weapons. I've seen other games like Destiny use this strategy with RNG loot, where you just take the old weapons, make them obsolete, and then re-add them with a little more damage, and it made all of your previous work in that game feel invalidated and wasted. I'm sure from the developer's point of view, it looks like an inexpensive way to wave a carrot in front of the player and keep them busy, but for me it looks more and more like it was a pointless grind to fight her in the first place. And now you have to wonder if you should worry about grinding her for the incandescent weapons now, or if it will become obsolete in a few months as well, which it probably will. We'll just have to see what we get. Something is better than nothing, so I do appreciate that they are still working on the game and that they're giving us Arch-Tempered Kovtaroth for free. I just think personally I would have liked to see them give us more incentive to fight some of the other monsters that really have interesting game mechanics like Barret and Gyrotodus. And that's another thing, Rosa basically confirmed that we won't be getting any more Arch-Tempered monsters with something he said later on in the stream, but we'll get to that in a minute. What's important to remember about the Arch-Tempered Kulftaroth update is that it will be available on December 19th, 2018, and it's going to be available until January 3rd, so write that down on your calendars, and if there are any leaks on the new armor set and the new weapons, I'll be sure to let you guys know. Okay, so moving on to update number two, Rosa talks about an upcoming appreciation festival, which I assume is going to work just like a seasonal event, and I'm sure this is going to start in February 2019, because he says himself that the event is going to be just in time for the one year anniversary of Monster Hunter World. This clears up some of the speculation about the leaked Galasu Alpha Armor that data miners recently found in the most recent patch. If you missed my armor review for the Galasu Alpha, I'll leave a link to it in the description and the comment section, or you can just click here. One thing Rozo did mention is that there would be, quote, a slew of new quests for the festival, as well as new equipment, and I'm not sure what that implies, but I'm hoping that it means there's still another weapon we haven't seen, since we already know that we're getting another lance. In fact, it would be amazing if there was a new weapon for each weapon class, but I feel like the odds for this are probably pretty bad, since they've probably already finished working on the Appreciation Festival, and now it's just waiting to launch. I don't have any problems with Capcom releasing these kinds of events. I think they're generally a fun thing to see in the game, and I'm glad they're finally adding armor that matters, like seasonal event armor, and hopefully we see some other new gear, like a layered Kulu head. I would love to see a layered Kulu head. However, here's what I am worried about. We know that the Kulf Taroth event ends on January 3rd, and we pretty much know that they aren't going to be working on Threat Level 2 uh, or, or Threat Level 1 Arch-Tempered Monsters, so does this mean the entire month of January we aren't going to have anything to do other than maybe revisit an Arch-Tempered Monster that they'll probably offer for the, you know, the weekly rotation? I'm assuming it does, and then going into February, we're going to get the Gala Suit and a new Lance that mostly no one really needed. So to me, this is sounding a little bit like after you've picked up the items in the appreciation event, you're not going to have anything to do in February either. Because for me, I get the event quest done in probably the first hour of the event being released, and then I don't have anything left to do afterwards, which I know isn't true for everyone, but I'm saying there's probably a large part of the player base where this is actually true. A lot of the, a lot of the players still playing Monster Hunter World, they've probably completed all the difficult quests, and they don't actually need these seasonal events and the seasonal events are too easy anyways, right? So we pick up the items from the appreciation event, and then what? Well, that's when Rozo announces the third update.
Doesn't seem all bad, this jaunt through another world. Slaying monsters happens to be a particular specialty of mine. Let me handle this one, Hunter. At a price, of course. Name's Geralt of Rivia. Witcher. Okay, so we're getting another collaboration event with The Witcher 3 this time, and I have to say that this is the first really juicy chunk of information we get from the developer update. The last collaboration event we got with the Behemoth of Final Fantasy was pretty amazing. Unfortunately, we only got one new weapon from the Behemoth event, but it's entirely possible that the Witcher event gives us new Laird armor, a new uh, Geralt armor set alpha, and maybe more than one new weapon. So. Uh, for now, I'm not going to cross my fingers and imagine that the Witcher event is going to be a godsend of new fresh content, but I'd, I'd like to sort of imagine it, right? We can at least speculate. What do you guys think? Will this be a full event with a new monster added to the game, or is it just going to be a new event quest with a Geralt armor set and one new weapon? I think the fact that Rosa didn't explicitly announce a new monster, the fact that the first teaser trailer doesn't show a new monster, and then on top of that, the fact that he mentions unique quests kind of has me feeling like it could end up being a pretty uh, small addition to the game. But who really knows? We're only in December, and the event will probably launch in March if I had to guess, so there's more time for the uh, for them to reveal new details. Rozo does make it a point to suggest that they've only shown a teaser, so there's hope for a new monster still. I think it's at least safe to speculate on what new weapon we're going to be getting to match the Geralt armor set, right? Like. It's highly unlikely it's going to be a ranged weapon. I doubt it would be the greatsword because the player movement is so slow and hefty. I'm actually leaning toward it being a longsword just because you need a weapon that Geralt will constantly be sheathing with a two-handed moveset and plenty of fluid movement. What do you guys think? Alternatively, it could be a sword and shield or even a switch axe, but the switch axe moveset starts to get a bit eccentric for something like a regular straight sword. Last note, something I found funny at this point in the developer update was when Rozo talks about recording new voice acting for the Witcher event, he mentions that some recordings were made for quote, Monster Hunter language. What could that possibly mean? Is he referring to the Palicos? And where can I get a degree in this language? Okay, so that was update number three. Let's move on to update number four, which is going to be all about arch-tempered Nergigante. Rozo starts off by showing us a screenshot of Nergigante. He then talks about how Nergigante is the main monster of Monster Hunter World. I just want to point out that this is why the arch-tempered version of Nergigante has to have a stronger set than the Behemoth Dragon armor set. Your flagship monster should have precedence over a collaboration monster from a different franchise. Right? Anyways. I made something of a wish list for Arch-Tempered Nergigante changes I'd like to see in a different video. If you'd like to talk about that, I'll leave a link in the description and the comment section down below. So the first question I had after seeing the Nergigante screenshot was whether or not we were actually looking at the new Arch-Tempered version of Nergigante. He doesn't have that typical Arch-Tempered metallic glow that we see on the other Arch-Tempered Elder Dragons. I figured it's probably unlikely just because we're so far off from when they're actually going to release Arch-Tempered Nergigante. Rozo mentions that Arch-Tempered Nergigante is going to be, quote, a very tough opponent, and I'm really, really hoping he wasn't exaggerating there. Arch-Tempered Nergigante could be like a third true boss type for Monster Hunter World, alongside the Behemoth and Arch-Tempered Zenejiva. Considering how the hardcore players don't really have that much to do in the game right now, I think adding another really difficult monster would be the best thing Capcom could do, and also the fact that he's not coming out for a while, Nergigante isn't, could mean that not only will we see it launch simultaneously on the PC and consoles, but the development team is going to have a lot of time to get him right and really make him feel like a fresh, challenging experience. There's one more thing Rosa reveals alongside Arch-Tempered Nergigante here, and that's mainly he's, he's going to be the last title update that Capcom has planned. What does that mean? That means no more free content from then on out. I'm guessing we'll still see seasonal events, but my hopes of an Arch-Tempered Gyratotus or Arch-Tempered Barith are pretty much over. I guess it also means no more Arch-Tempered Extreme Behemoth. I also wanted to mention at this point in the stream I was feeling pretty nervous because for all I knew, Rozo was about to wave goodbye and walk off the stage. <laughs> Luckily that was not the case. Be 
feels like somebody wants to sell me something! <laughs> I told you he was on to us! Awesome, so the Iceborne trailer confirms that Capcom wants to give us a paid expansion, and I think that's a terrific idea. In fact, I hope that it's followed shortly by a second expansion. Let's start breaking down the trailer. First of all, the title Iceborne obviously means we're getting a new map, right? Like, we watched Rathalos fly off to a distant land, and Iceborne means Burr is going to be cold outside because now you're in the Arctic or something like it. The title Iceborne also might be revealing something else. It could be the case that all we're getting is a single new ice map, something I kind of hoped uh, would have just been a free title update. I'm basing my thoughts off of Iceborne's name, which sounds very region specific. Now don't get me wrong, I think turning this into an expansion was the right financial move for Capcom, but if I'm going to be shelling out money for the next Monster Hunter experience, I would have hoped that it would either be for more than one map, or at least that there were fully two expansions, each with one new map. Orozo didn't explicitly say that there would be two expansions, so that's something we're going to have to speculate on. For me, this issue is not about price or cost. I mean, this is my primary entertainment. I don't go to the movies, I don't shop for other new toys. This is it. $25 each for two new expansions would be absolutely fine with me. I don't know about you guys, but I would not bat an eye. But the reason I'm suggesting there may be two expansions is just because Iceborne is such a specific name, it follows a pattern where games will give their DLCs very specific names, like for example Dark Souls 3 are Ashes of Oriental, and then Dark Souls 3 The Ring City, right? Same idea. So what Capcom could have done is they could have just named it uh, the expansion Monster Hunter World Ultimate, a generic name that suggests this is their typical G-Rank re-release. But they went with a map specific name the same way a game like destiny makes raid specific dlcs okay so speculation number one there could be a second expansion the counter argument to this is that there was text that appeared on the screen that used the word locales which if you're not super familiar with english locales is simply a word that means locations or places and in this case the use of the word is plural meaning there's going to be more than one place However, that could mean there's a new gathering hub and a new ice map, which effectively means only one new map, right? Or it could mean there's one ice map and one water map. That would be two maps, right? That would be two places. So two very different outcomes from the same use of the word locales. What we can be sure of is that they didn't actually specify that we would get two maps. So uh, allow yourself to uh, consider the worst case scenario. <laughs> Next, we also know that the trailer itself gives us some new information. Mostly everyone seems to agree that the ending of the trailer revealed Nargakuga, which is great news because that means Capcom would likely be adding a new skeleton to the game. If you don't know what I mean by skeleton, I'm referring to the wireframe assets game developers use to create new game characters. And why is that important? Because the introduction of a Nargakuga skeleton will likely also mean the addition of other monsters using the same skeleton. This is what we've already seen in Monster Hunter World multiple times. Personally, I would be fine if most of the new monsters were entirely new to this series, but there's also a lot of speculation that we'll see Tigrex and or Bariath, two monsters that use the Nargakuga skeleton and you find them in snow regions as well. We can also pretty much assume Orochi, Kirin, and Alatrion were moved off to this new expansion. I think this has some players angry that we weren't getting them as free title updates, but keep in mind Capcom never actually confirmed we were getting these monsters for free. All we knew is that an employee leaked a list of monsters that were coming to Monster Hunter World. So I can see how some players would feel frustrated having their expectations unmet about Orochi Kirin and Alatrion, but honestly, how many title updates can a AAA developer really hand out without seriously getting into the microtransaction business model? I know the seasonal events sell handler outfits, and you can also buy some emotes, but there are no gambling style microtransactions in Monster Hunter World, and the microtransactions that are in the game, they don't really get pushed on the player very much, so it's not really a sustainable model for constantly getting free content. I would say just keep in mind that we already got Devil Joe, Kulv Tiroth, Behemoth, and Lunastra, as well as some other small events, and admittedly, I did enjoy each of the Arch-Tempered uh, Elder Dragons the first couple times I killed them, so it's not like we didn't get a decent chunk of free content added into the game after the launch. 
if anything, I think Capcom, if you're going to criticize them, I would criticize them more along the lines of maybe not communicating as much, uh, maybe not planning to have a paid expansion prepared by the first year anniversary. I mean, that's a whole year for a game. A game's life cycle is not that long. A lot of people stop playing a game just a few months later, right? So uh, making us wait an additional eight to nine months, that's a pretty long time. But who knows, maybe it's all due to the fact that they weren't entirely sure how popular it was going to be Monster Hunter World, and so they couldn't predict how large of a team they were going to need? I mean, I'm just guessing. I don't actually know. Uh, I do know businesses don't intentionally try to hurt themselves. So if you love the franchise, you know, and you're mad at how they've treated it, go play another game. There's no, it's not worth your time to just be angry at somebody who's actually out there making fresh content. After all, we do finally know that we are getting an expansion, just that you're going to want to probably have another game to play during the long downtime between, I don't know, like January and February, or between Arch Tempered Nergigante and the eventual expansion release. For other games, I'm going to be checking out Bioware's Anthem, which I'm actually cautiously excited for. If you guys didn't know this, I started my YouTube channel out years ago playing Mass Effect 3 multiplayer, and back then I never imagined doing YouTube as a serious kind of job. So now Anthem is around the corner, and I'm hoping it's made by the same team that made the Mass Effect multiplayer so fun. I also just bought Super Smash Bros. Ultimate at midnight, and I've been playing it pretty much non-stop. Which, by the way, if you also picked up Smash Bros. and you would like a chance to play against me, which I would love that, be sure to join my Discord and ask for a match. I have a link in the description, like I always do. Anyways, getting back to the announcement of Iceborne. Capcom has described the DLC as massive, right? We know there's a new quest rank, which is probably G rank. We know it uses the word locales plurally. Notice also that the text reveals the weapons are likely going to receive new moves, which was something I really felt was needed in order to have true weapon variety. This is especially true if you only main one or two weapon classes. We also know that we're getting more story, hopefully something a little more memorable, but I'm not going to get my hopes up on that. The Monster Hunter World story didn't really involve any character development or dramatic twists. I was never worried about, you know, the bad guy winning, but I didn't buy the game to play the story mode anyway, so it's not a big deal to me. Finally, the last word we get on the screen is new equipment. This was pretty obvious. We also get this sexy image of four hunters wearing the new armor. I especially like the one with the huge moose antlers. Where do you guys think that came from? Also, that lady armor is pretty mwah, spicy, but also I imagine she'd be super cold if you really think about it. And check out the damn sexy light bow gun in the back with a row of ammunition that makes you think of a machine gun. Could that be a new special ammo type for the light bow gun weapon class? Uh, you know, back when I was critiquing the light bow guns, that was one of my main complaints that you only get Wyvern Blast, whereas the heavy bow guns get both Wyvern Snipe and Wyvern Heart. So maybe we get a new machine gun mode for the light bow guns. We'll have to wait and see. We have somewhere between 8 and 9 whole months before this expansion comes out, meaning most of us are going to be about a year older. <laughs> Happy birthday, right? In the meantime, we'll have to make the most out of Arch-Tempered Kolv Taroth, Arch-Tempered Nergigante, and the Witcher collaboration, which, please God, includes another monster like the Royal Wyvern. That would be pretty cool. Let me know what you guys thought of the developer update. Were you disappointed? Are you feeling better about it at this point? Again, I'm just happy that they're communicating with us. I mean, there are a lot of other games to play, and now we know we have something nice to look forward to, even if it's coming out really far away from now. In the meantime, maybe we'll be playing Anthem if it's any good, and I already know I'm going to be spending a lot of time with Smash Brothers. Also, I hope to transfer over to the PC version of Monster Hunter World so I can play with some of the modding community's creations. They're pretty good with that stuff. So that's there's also that. Alright, well that's everything I have to say about the developer update. I want to thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.